Hey, welcome, welcome, welcome. Good evening. Let's stand together. That's a real baby. Yeah, that could, wow, that's so beautiful. Come on in when you're outside, you're having a conversation, just bring it in here. We'll shut you down and bring it back up again. Come on, Pastor. Get in here. Do with the hat. Come on. There you go. Another baby. I heard too. Hey, guys, let's pray. Father God, it's just a joy and a privilege and we get to come here and just enjoy you and spend some time with you and know that you don't get tired of this and neither do we lord we give you this time we ask that you would be god in this moment we ask that you would fill us with your holy spirit that this worship that we're about to do would be genuine that we worship you in spirit and in truth, that we will worship you with everything that we are and that the words that were coming out of our mouth would be connected to our hearts, Lord. Thank you for that. Thank you for that instruction. And then we just ask that you would would inhabit our praise, Lord. We ask also that you would speak to us through your word tonight and then also that we would not um, take lightly just the family that we have here together. It is so precious. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So we put tonight in your hands. Thank you that you love us and that your love never fails. Anything that we're going through, Lord, we know that you love us. That's your word. That's your promise. Give you honor and praise tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.
go find somebody you don't know. Say hi.
Is this thing on? Hey, hey there we go. <laughs> Woohoo! I like it when it works. <laughs> hey, tomorrow night, well, let, me ask this, let me ask it this way first. How many of you in here are married? How many of you in here are thinking about getting married? How many of you in here want to stay married? All right, marriage builders tomorrow night. We're going to be continuing in our study uh, and time of fellowship. We're going to be looking at spiritual gifts and how those combine within couples. And guys, it's amazing because God has gifted each and every one of us with so many different aspects of who he is, giving us gifts that we may then be able to touch the world around us. And something very, very unique happens in the, in the process of marriage, and that is that two people become one flesh. And the idea is very simple. They're no longer two, but they're made one of two, and it creates exponentially growth within each. It provides for strength. It provides for, well, the ability. I love what Scripture says. It says if one falls up, the other one's there to pick them, or falls down, the other one's there to pick them up. That it's warmer. Two, when they're cold, can snuggle. That's my interpretation, but it actually says that in God's Word. But what happens with our gifts is we wind up having, having them exponentially brought about through the Lord and His Spirit. So if tomorrow night, if you haven't, and even if you weren't here for the other portion of it, you come out tomorrow night. We have a time of food and fellowship first, and then a time of being able to take and encourage each other in our marriages. So that happens and starts tomorrow night at 6 p.m. right here. Bring a dish, whatever you want, come and join in. All right. If you don't have a Bible tonight, please put your hand up. Hold it up really, really high. We are going to do something. Man, Sunday we completed Galatians. Tonight we're going to complete Nehemiah. We're running out of two books at the same time. Thankfully, there's only 64 left in the Bible that we can go back to. So we will never run out of the Word of God. Let's ask him to bless this time of Bible study. Heavenly Father God, we come before you. And Lord, we do so hoping that you would... Open our minds and our hearts to receive, Lord, as we look at your dealings with your people Israel and how it is that they find themselves going in and out of that which is not only of you, but, Lord, that brings either success or failure. So, Lord, we thank you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When we left off in our last study, what we found is Israel had set their minds on returning to the Lord. And in verse 38 of chapter 9, it says, And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it. Our leaders, our Levites, and our priests seal it. And in verse 1 of chapter 10, it leads off with this saying, And now those who place their seal on the document were Nehemiah the governor and all the rest of those guys through verse 27. If you want to read those, you can, and I encourage you to do that later and record it so that you can listen to it over and over again. But Israel's move back towards God came because they went back and looked at their history. And by looking at history, they recognized that there was a common denominator. There was something that they could pinpoint in relationship to when it was that they were well and when they were not. It seemed like every time that they failed... It was because they turned away from God. I mean, every time that they struggled, every time that there was an issue, every time they found themselves in bondage, every time they found themselves not prospering, the conclusion was very simple. They had turned away from God, and therefore they failed. And so they came up with what I believe is, is just such a simple cure for that, and that is with God, we succeed. Without God, we fail. Now, I want you to pay really, really close attention because I believe that that is the secret to life. You know how many people have been looking for the secret to life since the beginning of time, all right? Monks contemplated, people climb up mountains looking for it. They, they om and they om and they do all of these things and they run all over the world looking for, the, for the, the meaning of and the secret of life. Here it is, it's right here. With God, we succeed. There it is. That's all you need to know. With God, we succeed. And the opposite is just as true. Without God, we're going to fail. 
The people and the leaders of Israel decide that they're going to sign a document. They're going to make a declaration based upon this understanding that they need to keep their focus upon God and stay with him. And it's not a declaration of independence. It's a declaration of dependence upon God. And by acknowledging the outcome of with or without God and realizing it identifies a pattern that is predictable for failure. The pattern is true for any nation or any empire. Failing without God has become something that history has recorded over and over and over again. One of the greatest examples that we have, how many of you have heard of the fail of the Roman Empire? The fa- they failed. And guys, we need to be aware that this pattern is is predictable, and without correction, we are in jeopardy of providing a greater example with the fail of America than we ever saw in the fail of the Roman Empire. Here's some of the issues that are common within this predictable aspect of failure. When it came to the Roman Empire, they had a problem with refugees. At the time of 220 A.D., the Great Wall of China was being built, and as war spread and the walls were put up to secure China, it caused refugees to scatter towards and into Roman territories. So great was this mass displacement that it wound up overwhelming the borders of Rome. Now, Rome had an open border policy. Go figure. And these immigrants poured over into these territories. The historians record that the influx of these refugees was so great, bringing different cultures and languages, that it didn't take any time at all. Because you see, the problem was the people coming in didn't assimilate. They didn't come to Rome to become Romans. They came to maintain their own people groups, their own culture, their own language. They didn't take and do anything to assimilate into that. And so in a very short period of time, Rome started losing its identity. And part of that was brought about by the loss of common language. Because when these folks came in, they didn't learn the language that was indigenous. They didn't learn to speak Latin. They didn't learn to speak what was, what was commonplace in there. And they kept their own languages, their own tribal tongues. And therefore, they started creating pockets within the Roman Empire where it was all about their civilization and nothing else. And all of a sudden, what you found is you found communities that are actually even then and now today being ruled and governed by those that have no connection to the country in which they live. Do you realize that there are jurisdictions within this country that have signed over and allow within that particular place in this country to be governed by Sharia law? There's communities and counties. There's places that you can't go in and speak English and have anybody in there understand what you're saying because it's not the first language or a second language for people. It's a non-language. And so this aspect of non-assimilation is huge because what it does is it tears away at any type of sense of unity. But then there were also, well, they had the welfare state. Starting around 123 BC, they had what was known as bread and the circus. And the Roman politicians began appeasing people by the way of welfare, monthly handouts of grain. One writer said that they controlled the masses by keeping them ignorant and obsessed with self-indulgence, purposing that they would not throw them out of office. So the people literally traded in self-government for bread and entertainment. The concentration of the population and poverty that was in the major cities, the government found itself choosing to destroy the economy by welfare rather than risk a riot or revolution. There were so many welfare jobs, so many people on welfare and government jobs that was started happening is, is that those that were living on public expense outweighed those who paid the public expenses. I'm so glad that can't happen here. It was class warfare. Those that were rich separated themselves from the poor. They left the cities and they moved to the country. They secured and created opportunities for themselves and no one else. In the inner cities, they became crowded with poor. They created slums and government dependency. The living conditions were so poor that people were literally living in tents on the sidewalks. 
In the major cities, an unhealthy and disease conditions exploded. Sex trade and crime became commonplace because they were means of survival. Then there were the taxes. Oh, <laughs> the taxes. They say the tax collectors of those days, it was written that they were more terrible than any enemy. The expansion of government entities devoured the nation's resources, and there was not enough revenue to cover all of the social programs that Rome tried to install. The sense of liberty that was once enjoyed was lost under the bondage of a new and massive weight of debt, and there was a loss of patriotism. Again, because of a lack of in, in, in joining or coming in unity and assimilating into the group, but there was also a lack because of the bondage of the weight of debt and the fact that people felt abandoned by the government. Oh, the government took care of itself, but there wasn't much left for the people. Economically, Rome outsourced. They outsourced, and as a matter of fact, at this particular point in time, the trade had stagnated in, in, a, in a deficit, and they outsourced the grain production to North Africa. A lack of self-sufficiency gave great advantage to those who held the wealth and the resources over Rome, the resources they needed to survive. And so they became so dependent on these foreign nations, on those that were even their enemies, that they became enslaved to those who had what they desperately needed. Oh, and again, massive debt ruled the day. Emperor Diocletian imposed wage and price controls, and he forbade people from changing prof pro professions. I mean, can you imagine the government actually telling people what they can and can't do? Can you imagine them imposing things upon people and removing their freedom? The choking taxes and the personal debt got to be so bad that many abandoned the properties that they, they had and owed mortgages on, and they went out and lived with the barbarians. They became street dwellers, not being able to make their payments. Diocletian responded by making it illegal to abandon their property. The government stepped in and made it illegal for people to leave their property, tied people permanently to the land, and this became the feudal system of the Middle Ages. I can't imagine how anybody could allow this to happen. The enormous debt of the government and the bureaucracy literally crippled their economy, and this machine that could not produce under its own weight effectively became so burdened that in time the government simply ran out of money and shut down. Oh, but it was being protected. It was being protected by self-promoting and corrupt politicians who were making sure that, well, everything continued to run the way that they wanted to. The self-educated and the highly educated and the rich, well, they pursued financial success and they involved themselves in political matters, but only in order to influence. The church was alive and well at this particular point in time. However, the church's position was very simple. They didn't want anyone that was a Christian to hold public office. It just wasn't a good thing. I mean, Christians shouldn't be involved in the government, don't you know? I mean, there, there shouldn't be any activity. Separation of Roman state and the church. What we wound up with, I'm sorry, what they wound up with it's kind of a, yeah, a little Freudian thing going on there, right? What they wound up with in government were uneducated, unskilled, and ungodly leaders. <coughs> AOC. And you wound up with all kinds of things where people didn't know what they were doing and had no sense of right or wrong. Oh, but there was violent entertainment. The Circus Maximus and the Colosseum were packed with crowds of Romans who were engrossed with violent entertainment, games, chariot races, gladiators fighting to the death. And then they also had the practice of discarding unwanted infants. Roman demographics had changed. The family had fewer children. Some were sold into slavery. Others were just left outside to be exposed to the elements and die. One historian wrote that children were now a luxury which only the poor could afford. Immorality, Rome had it all. Corrupted courts that favored the rich, bribes or, or political contributions set the standard and injustice ruled the systems. Sexual immorality, everything you can imagine. Can you imagine at this particular point in time that they had trouble figuring out their genders? 
infidelity, perverted bathhouses, gluttony, gymnasiums. Be careful when you go to the gym. Understand that it's the Greek word for naked. <laughs> Military cuts. At one time, the greatest power in the world with large and well-disciplined military operatives no longer had an inclination to defend itself. As seen as weak and unwilling to do so, those that set out to destroy Rome wasted no time in attacking, among which was the scourge of God. We better know him as Attila the Hun. Attila the Hun was considered to be the Antichrist, and he devastated Europe with a half million warriors. Aquilia, one of the largest cities in the world at the time, was so completely destroyed that the inhabitants literally ran into the ocean. They started pounding logs down into the water, and they built platforms on top of them, and eventually it became the city of Venice. What do we see? Problems with refugees, open borders, loss of common language, the welfare state, class welfare, taxes, outsourcing, debt, self-promoting and corrupt politicians, violent entertainment, extermination of unwanted infants, immorality, military cuts, and terrorist attacks. Guys, history has and is repeating itself. It's that simple. With God, we succeed. Without God, we're going to fail. In verse 28, it says, Now the rest of the people, the priests and the Levites, the gatekeepers and the singers, and the Nedjanim, all of those who had separated themselves from the people of the land to the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, everyone who had knowledge and understanding, underline that, Everyone who had knowledge and understanding, these joined with their brethren, their nobles, and they entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, our Lord, and his ordinances and his statutes. Everyone who had knowledge and understanding, I... So hope that that's everybody in this room. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> someone, we talked about it on Sunday, how the world has gone nuts and how there's no other word to describe it than insanity. And you wonder how it is that people can't understand, don't understand. If there's not any place that there aren't people or the only place that is left that there are people that understand is the house of God, then that makes sense to me. Because it's the only place that has the Word of God and is teaching and upholding the things of God promoted by the Spirit of God and therefore bringing understanding. We can't have understanding outside the Word of God and the things of God. And so if you're wondering why the world is nuts, it's simple. Without God, we fail. And yet, what happens here? is that everyone that had understanding joined together with their brethren, and they made a vow, a vow to walk in the things of the Lord. If we're going to overcome evil, the only way that we're going to be able to do so is we have to return to the Lord. And it was this that united Israel, and it came, understand, from the people. So often, the, the, the society sits around and we wait for the leadership. We wait for some great leader. We wait for somebody to rise. If we can just hire, a, just elect, and just get the right person in this place of leadership, if we can just get somebody that, that, will, that will lead, and we forget the fact that, that when it comes to especially what we've been blessed here is that as we are the church, we are also the government. We're supposed to be. We are the People, we're the people, and we're either going to be the people of God or we're not going to be the people of God. If we are the people of God with God, we succeed. Without God, we fail. fail. Hmm. It's pretty simple. And I love the fact that what we see here is the people said, you know what? We're going to stand up and we're going to do something. Everyone who had knowledge and understanding, and guys, if that's the church today, then the church needs to be the one that stands up and says, you know what? In the face of a world that has lost its mind, we're going to do what is right. 
And we need to stop worrying, and I don't know how many times I've said this, we need to stop worrying about offending anyone. There's nobody left to offend but us. And they don't care if we're offended. Just my existence offends most people in the world, let alone what I think or say. This right here is the greatest offense to anyone who refuses to accept and receive Jesus Christ. If we stand upon this, understand, everyone else is offended by you. So quit worrying about those that are offended. If we're so worried about somebody's feelings that somehow or another that we won't speak the truth, then we need to realize that by not doing so, then we are not holding up what we're called to do. Guys, I don't know about you. Do you guys sense the fact that we're like running out of time? I mean, do, do, do you really, I mean, do you really feel that or do you think, oh, we're just in a downturn? This is just a slump. I'm sure we'll pull out of it in 2024. <laughs> uh, yeah, normal is not coming back. The only thing that's coming back is Jesus Christ. Amen. And in the meantime, we have a mission. We're supposed to be those who had knowledge and understanding and are willing to share it. Israel also sets out to correct the social issues and realign themselves with God. <laughs> Israel does something crazy. This is so insane. Are you ready? They set out to fix the social issues of the day because the governance of the people was going to be based on the Word of God. They've got their standards from the Word of God. And in verse 30, it says, We would not give our daughters and wives to the people of the land, nor take their daughters for our sons. If the people of the land brought wares or any grain to sell on a Sabbath day, we would not buy it from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day, and we would forego the seventh year of produce and the exacting of every debt. In verse 32, it says, We also made ordinances for ourselves to exact from, our, exact from ourselves yearly one-third a shekel for the service of the house of God. And, and guys, I'm going to go through this kind of quick. The provisions, what they're saying here is they made for the house of God. They went ahead and they went back to, to the, the things that God's word had said and said, we're going to provide to make sure that the rules by which we're following, which is God's word, are being supported. In verse 34, it says, We cast lot amongst the priests and the Levites and the people for bringing of wood and offering into the house of the Lord. They, believe it or not, they assigned people to work. They actually looked around and saw what needed to be done. And they assigned people and said, you know what? You are going to provide this service. You are going to be the one that is accountable and responsible for this. We're no longer going to wait for somebody else to do it. You're going to do it. And they identified by virtue, of, by, by, by name and by family, those that were responsible for this. And in verse 35, it says, And we made ordinances to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all the fruit trees. They established ordinances for raising revenue in order to establish and maintain this new government in which they had found themselves under. And then in verse 39, it says, For the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of grain of the new wine and the new oil to the storerooms where the articles of the sanctuary are, where the priests who minister and the gatekeepers at, and the singers are, and we will not neglect the house of our God. Guys, this is, this is the key. The people come back together. They look at what God's Word says. They look at how it is that they are to respond and to follow the commands of God, and they agree that they are going to do everything that it says in the Word of God, that they're going to do everything that God has commanded them to do, and they are not going to neglect the house of God. They're not going to neglect the things of God. And guys, this goes beyond just a, a corporate understanding. Israel at that time following the commands and the law of Moses is so different than where we are today. And really, it's not. The idea is, is that we get to individually determine and decide if we are going to follow the things that God has given us in his word. And we start it out individually, and we do it in our hearts and our minds, and we commit to it, and then we bring somebody else along. If you're a couple, the two have become one. You're supposed to be like-minded. It should be something that is without exception that you're going to follow and agree on the things of God in your life and cause that to be that which governs your relationship with him and with each other. If you bring kids into the situation, guess what? The kids are supposed to be subject to the rule of the house. The house is supposed to be ruled by God. If God is ruling the house, then the kids will be ruled by God. If nobody's ruling the house, the kids aren't ruled, and they become unruly. 
And all of a sudden, the kids start running the house. And we wonder why today, I just read an article the other day about how the, the third grade teachers in this community are terrified of their students. They become so violent, so out of control, so ill-behaved that they're calling for security in the third grade. Seven-year-olds. When I was a seven-year-old, I didn't know how to do anything I wasn't told to do. And I certainly didn't do anything I wasn't supposed to do because there was a correction that followed it. Because there was a God that ruled in the house in which I grew up. Because with God, we succeed. Without God, we fail. Hmm. You see a common theme happening here? In verse 11, or excuse me, chapter 11, it says, Now the leaders of the people dwelt at Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine-tenths were to dwell in other cities. And the people blessed all the men who were willingly offered themselves to dwell in Jerusalem. So this is kind of interesting. They, they kind of did a lottery system. They cast lots, and one out of every ten was going to live and dwell inside the city of Jerusalem. And we talked about it before. Jerusalem wasn't that big. Now, remember, right now, we counted them in, in one of our previous studies. There was a, a little bit over 50,000 that were inside the city walls at the time of the building. The area is about the same area as from the front street side on Enterprise over to Fortune. You with me? Where the, where the, where the urgent care is. So if you go here and you go across the desert— Pass the new homes and run into the, to, to the, the, the side of the urgent care, that's about the length and the width of the city of Jerusalem. It's the city size. Take and put 50,000 people in that area. That's a lot of folks. So they go down and they do a lot system. And they say, one out of 10 is going to stay in the city. The rest of you are going to go out and form cities outside. We've got a secure place. If something happened, if they needed to, they could all go inside. They could all come into the, in, in, into the secured city and they could be there. And they would also come back and forth for comments and for trading and for doing business and such. But they weren't all going to be able to live there. 50,000 people compressed into an area that size isn't going to work. And so we see that happening as part of this. And when we look at verses 3 all the way down through 36, what we see is an accounting, a detailed of all of those families by name that were either inside or outside and where they dwelled. And again, we're not going to take and have the fun and the joy of going through all of these different names. I know you would like me to try. No. Not going to happen. Into chapter 12, we see the assignments of priests and Levites. And because they were going to be governed by God, it was necessary that the house of God be put into order. And there is a need for complete diligence when it comes to what goes in and what goes through the church. And we talked about this Sunday. We talked about how there is a mandate for sound doctrine. If a church is going to do that which honors the Lord, if we're going to be those who are doing what God has called us to do, then we must do it based upon His Word, not based upon man's opinion. And it has to be that which is tied to the truth, not the truth as we would want to interpret it. Because you know what? There's a lot of things in the Word of God that personally I don't agree with. I don't agree with them. I don't like them. Tough, because <laughs> that's how it is. So what needs to happen is not for me to change the Word of God in order to make it me happy. I need to change my heart, and I need to take and change my understanding in order for me to be obedient to the Lord that wrote this and then find myself in His blessings, because it doesn't work the other way around. Because with God, we succeed, and without God, we fail. And so there's a lot of people out there right now that are failing because they've taken the Word of God, and they go, I don't like that. I don't like what it says. I don't, you know what? That's mean. That's terrible. I don't, I don't believe that that's the way it should be. And so what they do is they take themselves outside of the relationship with God, and they dictate to God what it is that he's supposed to believe on their behalf. And what they found is they found now that they're no longer in that place of unity. They're no longer with God. They are absolutely outside and without God. And failure is certain. 
There's no other means by which success will come than to stay in with the Lord. The enemy loves to take and do whatever he can to make wrong look mostly right. Have you ever noticed that, that when, when the enemy takes and promotes something, and although Nehemiah wasn't responsible for the oversight, he was completely invested in the process, so he wants to make sure it doesn't go wrong. And so we, we look at what happens when the enemy comes in and he says that this section or that section or this thing or that is not up to snuff with the culture. You realize that the culture changes the Word of God, right? Boy, you guys were slow on it. You had to think about that for a minute. No, what's supposed to happen is, is that the Word of God and the people of God are supposed to change the culture. That's the way that it's supposed to happen. In verse 12, it says, Now these were the priests and the Levites who came with Zerubbabel and the son of Shatil and Jeshua. And then there's all the rest of them going down to verse 26. They were the ones that came. These were the priests. These were the Levites. And so they go in and they identify those who have a place in the house of God. They go in and they identify those who are of God, those who will do that which is correct and right in accordance with God's Word. Guys, right now we need to understand that there is an awful lot of religion in the world. There's an awful lot of Christian religions in the world, but there's not an awful lot of religion and there's not a lot of Christian religions that will stand upon and adhere to and hold up the Word of God for what it is and not go outside of what it says and not add to it and not take away from it. And so it's important when we start looking at what we align with, what we affiliate with. And guys, this is so important because I know that there's all of this whole outside world that's on the old interweb and all of this stuff that's going on out there. And you go out and you listen to and you find and you come across and you listen to that guy and you listen to this guy. And, oh, did you see this thing? And there's a part of it that's true. And again, the enemy loves to take an ounce of truth and try to turn it into a pound of fact but it's actually a pound of something else. And the reality is, is that we need to know who and what we're listening to. And if whatever it is does not stand the test of this book, then there's a problem. If it doesn't stand the test of God and His Word, then it's not of God. And guys, it's that simple. And this is what was happening. They're cleaning up the house of God. And now the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought out the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgiving and singing, with cymbals and with stringed instruments and harps. And the sons of the singers gathered together from the countryside around Jerusalem, from the villages, from Neth the fights, and the house of Gilgal, and from the fields of Geba and Asmath. Of the singers had built themselves villages around Jerusalem. Then the priests and the Levites purified themselves and purified the people, the gates and the wall. So I brought the leaders of Judah up on the wall, and I appointed two large thanksgiving choirs. One of them went to the right hand on the wall toward the refuge gate. And then there were all these other guys that went with them. And then in verse 38, it says, the other Thanksgiving choir went the other way, went the opposite way. And I was behind them with half of the people on the wall, going past the tower of the ovens as far as the broad wall and above the gate of Ephraim, above the old gate, above the fish gate, and the tower of Hananel, the tower of a hundred as far as the sheep gate. And they stopped by the gate of the prison. So you got to get the people or get the picture here. Nehemiah takes and he, and he creates this entire celebration for the whole city. And they go out and they find all of the Levites and all of those that are supposed to be servants of God. And they bring them into the city and they bring all the people in, and he forms these massive choirs, these great big, huge, huge aspects of, of those that are going to sing praises to the Lord. And he goes up on the gate. And if you haven't been there, you haven't seen it, it's an amazing thing. The walls of the city of Jerusalem aren't that big. This isn't like 20 feet wide to where you can get a lot of people. As a matter of fact, there's places where the rampart that goes around the wall would have been rebuilt. And we don't know exactly what it was then now, but we will assume that it wasn't a whole lot different than what we see today. You might be able to stand too, too deep or too wide on the wall. And so for them to go around, these guys literally encircled the entire, again, put the picture of your mind, the space between here and there, 
a wall going all the way around. And there, every inch of that wall covered by singers and by priests and by those that are going to give glory to God. Wouldn't it be cool if we could encapsulate this city with those that would give honor and praise and glory and shout worship to the Lord? This is what's happening here. This is what Nehemiah is causing to happen. So the two Thanksgiving choirs stood in the house of God. Likewise, I and half of the rulers with me and the priests and then those guys and the singers sang loudly with Jezariah, the director. And also that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. Huge celebration. Barbecue. Oh, man. When it says that they did sacrifices, they were burning meat, man. They were, they were creating that which was in it. And, and the thing that's amazing is not only was this the men, which would have had priority in that particular culture, but it says the women and the children, everybody got involved. And so loud was it that everybody even outside the city heard what was taking place and all of the noise that was being generated. Let me tell you something. There is something so cool that happens when you just hear the people of God engaging, either in worship. I mean, I, you guys know, I, I, I stand up here in, in, in the times of worship, and I'm, I'm paying attention, but I'm listening to you guys. And there is something that is so cool when you start hearing the people of God worship, when you start hearing a collective voice rise. There's something that is amazing that happens just in the time of fellowship when we're doing meet and greet, and you walk in and you just hear the noise that's happening before or at that time during service, and people are just talking, and there's a, there's a, there's a noise that just fills this room. Dave and I, every once in a while, we'll just look at each other and go, did you hear that? Do you hear that? We can't hear nothing. It's just, it's just noise. Oh, but it sounds great. It sounds so good because it's that aspect of praise and, and worship going up to the Lord. You guys don't even realize you're doing it. But your presence alone in the house of God, the spirit that comes in with you and communicating with the, the spirit of God and other people brings together one collective voice that if you could hear it from where we do up here, you would hear this sound of praise raising up to heaven. And this is what was happening as these guys started singing at the top of their lungs. And at the same time, some were appointed over the rooms and the storehouses for offerings and the first fruits and the tithe to gather them into and from the fields of the cities, the portion specified by the law for the priests and the Levites. For Judah rejoiced over the priests and the Levites who ministered. The people actually liked their pastor. And both the singers and the gatekeepers kept charge of their God and the charge of the purification according to the command of David and Solomon, his son. For in the days of David and Asaph, the house, the old, or, or the old were the chiefs of the singers and the songs and praise and thanksgiving of God. And in the days of Zerubbabel and in the days of Nehemiah, all Israel gave portions for the singers and the gatekeepers, a portion for each day. They also consecrated holy things for the Levites, and the Levites consecrated them for the children of Aaron. The people are now in a different place. If you remember, it wasn't but just months ago that the city was wide open, that it was destitute, that there was no poverty. The people were in desperation. They couldn't get ahead. Anything that they accumulated got stolen. There was no way to secure it. And now just a little bit of time later, what they find is they find not only are they secure, but they're prospering, that they're starting to be able to grow, and so much that they're able to take and support the house of God, the work of God, and those that are participating in it. And the reason was very simple. With God, we succeed. And without God, we fail. They were experiencing success. They were experiencing success because they were doing the things that God had prescribed for them. And, and, and understand, the success that they were having, the prosperity that they were taking in was happening only because of God. And it concerns me when I see all of this talk of prosperity absence the things of God. I don't know if you know this or not, but all of the different sides of the political surface, circus <laughs> promise prosperity. You may not be paying attention right now, but if you go up to a certain news channel, which is most of them, you will find that we are enjoying the best economic times that we've had in the last 40 years, right? 
Well, that's what they say. Things are great. Things are going wonderful. The programs are working. Everything is happening to the success of the company and our country and the people that are in it. Oh, so we're constantly waiting for the next guy to come in, and hopefully the next guy that comes in will straighten all that stuff out. Let me tell you what. Man has never brought prosperity to man. It doesn't matter. There's going to be ebbs and flows, and things are going to be better on one side or better. But the only way and the only thing that brings prosperity is God. And the only way that we will experience God's prosperity is with God we succeed. You see how simple this is? Did you guys realize you're going to come here and learn something so simple tonight? I know you were hoping for something much deeper, weren't you? 13. On that day, they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and in it found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever come into the assembly of God, because they had not met the children of Israel with bread and water, but they hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. So it was when they had heard the law that they separated all the mixed multitude from Israel. Can you believe how racist God is? I mean, I mean, this is discrimination. I mean, there are those who would say God is unfair in his dealing with people. And here's something I want you to understand, and I'm sure that if somebody gets a hold of this on the video, they will misuse this. So go ahead, misuse this if you will. God discriminates against people. He does. God discriminates against that which is holy and that which is unholy. God can only be in the presence because God is in the presence of and is the presence of holiness. He will not tolerate, does not in any way, shape, or form associate with that which is not holy, period. If he did, he wouldn't be God. He wouldn't be God. So in that sense, he is discriminating. Now, what he doesn't discriminate on is based upon any of the things that people want him to discriminate on. God doesn't discriminate on color, or he doesn't discriminate by sex, or he doesn't discriminate by race or by national origin or any of those things. He doesn't discriminate because anyone and everyone, whosoever will, can find salvation through Jesus Christ. But if you are not one of the whosoevers, Consider yourself discriminated against. Because the discrimination of God is that you are either in his son Jesus Christ, covered by the sacrifice of his blood and his righteousness, or you are not. Now, I at times have wished it wasn't so. There's times when I wish <laughs> that God would just accept everyone. There are times when I wish that it didn't matter if people believed in God. I mean, there's times when I've looked at folks and just thought, man, wouldn't it be great if everybody just went to heaven? I mean, wouldn't it be? I mean, come on. It's not a bad concept, is it? Wouldn't it be great? You go through life, you struggle, you do whatever it is that you're going to do. You do the best you can. And no matter what, at the end of the process, you get to go to heaven. Tell me you haven't thought about that at some point in time. Oh, that's what the enemy wants. The enemy wants people to believe that. But see, <laughs> the enemy will, again, use something that sounds right, even though it's wrong, in order to get people to miss out on that which God has clearly identified as a singular plan for the salvation of mankind. Now, here's the deal. It doesn't matter if you like it or not. You see, it doesn't matter if I wish it to be so. Nobody asks me. God didn't come to me and ask me what I thought his plan for the salvation of mankind should be because God is sovereign and God gets to make that determination all by himself. So whether I agree with it or not, whether I, I believe that it's right, whether I want to accept it or not has absolutely no bearing on the fact that that is the truth of what it reveals in God's word, that salvation comes only through Jesus Christ. And so while there may be all kinds of good people by the standard established by the world, you know, good people as far as the world is concerned is somebody that doesn't get caught doing something wrong. And if they do, it wasn't too wrong. And that makes them good. Well, then they're good people. And because they're good people, shouldn't all good people get to go to heaven? No, there are no good people because the only one that is good is God. And because of that, we have to play by his rules. If we refuse to do so, he will discriminate against us. 
telling somebody that's rejected Jesus Christ that they're okay, that they're all good with God, (laughs) is a lie. Accepting those who refuse to acknowledge and abide by the righteous standards of God, inviting them into fellowship as if somehow or another everything's all right, is not going to bring them salvation. Israel saw in the Word of God that they were supposed to separate themselves out from those who oppose God. And they did. And guys, we should do no less. Now, before this, Elisha, the priest, having authority over the storerooms of the house of God, was allied with Tobiah, and he had prepared for him a large room where previously they had stored grain offerings and the frankincense and articles and tithes of grain and new wine and oil, which were commanded to be given to the Levites and singers and gatekeepers and the offerings for the priest. You guys remember Tobiah, right? He was that outsider. He wasn't, he wasn't Jewish. He had opposed the building of the temple. He had opposed the building of the wall. He was one of the ones that tried to raise armies to come against Nehemiah. But he was a strong, non-Jewish political businessman. And in his ability to be able to influence, he bought off many of the leaders of Jerusalem, many of the priests, many of the religious leaders. And he had great influence over the priesthood, and so they wind up providing him a place (laughs) that was set aside for sacrifices and for offerings to be given to God. They cleared out a storehouse, and they give this guy an office inside Jerusalem in the area of the temple. He doesn't belong there. And yet they allow him to do this. And what's going to happen now is there's going to need to be a little bit of a correction take place. And it says in 6 that during all of this, I was not being Nehemiah in Jerusalem. And for the 36th year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Then after certain days, I obtained leave from the king, and I came to Jerusalem, and I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah in preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me bitterly. Therefore, I threw all the household goods of Tobiah out of the room. Everybody go like this. Yay! The church of God requires godly leadership, or it will become worldly. And while Nehemiah was gone, the house of God becomes corrupt. And it says that he was gone for a while, and when he came back, that he saw what was going on, and he didn't even hesitate. He didn't go in and negotiate. He didn't go in and find out what the circumstances were. When he came into the house of God, and he saw something in the house of God that didn't belong in the house of God because it was ungodly, he threw it out. And guys, that's what needs to happen. And unfortunately, right now, there are all kinds of churches across this country that are sitting there and allowing Tobiah to sit in the house of God right alongside of them, corrupting everything and everyone that's in it, and not taking any measure or taking any action against it. And it's very simple. With God, we will succeed. Without God, we'll fail. Those churches are destined to fail because they are without God, because they are not upholding the rule and the law of God when it comes to that which is holy. Then I commanded them to cleanse the rooms, and I brought back into them the articles of the house of God with the grain offerings and the frankincense. I also realized that the portions for the Levites had not been given them, for each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to their fields. So bad was this that those that were in the house of the Lord had been displaced by this which didn't belong in the house of the Lord to the point that they quit working in the house of the Lord to go outside and work and make money. And he said it straight. And so I contended with the rulers, and I said, Why is the house of the Lord forsaken? And I gathered them together, and I set them in their place. And then all of Judah brought the tithe of grain and the new wine and the oil to the storehouse. And I appointed as treasurer over them Shelemiah, the priest, and Zadok, the scribe, and all the Levites, Pedadiah. And, and next to them was Hanan, the son of Zakor, and the son of Mananiah. For they were considered faithful, and their task was to distribute to their brethren. He says, remember me, O God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God for its services. 
Nehemiah sets out to restore order in the house of the Lord. And he's going to make some hard changes. And in these changes, it's going to bring some opposition. He's going to ruffle some feathers. And so his prayer is very simple. He doesn't worry about appeasing the people. He goes to God. He says, God, I want to make sure that whatever I do, I'm only doing it for your honor and for your glory. So, God, I'm going to pray that you're going to keep me on the right path. And in those days, I saw the people of Judah treading the wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in the sheaves and loading donkeys with wine and grapes and figs and all kinds of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them about the day on which they were selling provisions. Men of Tyre dwelt there also who brought in fish and all kinds of good and sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Judah in Jerusalem. His attention next is turned to the profaning of the Sabbath. And I understand the Sabbath commandment is specific to Israel. Keeping of the Sabbath was specific to Israel as given by God to Moses in the commandments. It is not something that we are subject to specifically to keep a Sabbath day. Jesus Christ has become our Sabbath rest. But for the Jew, this was an absolute no-no. Even now, today, you go to Jerusalem, sundown on Friday night, they shut the place down, man. You could, you can... You you can't find anything moving, man. They close everything down, and it doesn't open up until sundown on Saturday. They observe the Sabbath. They've at least learned that aspect of it, and here this wasn't happening, and trading and bartering and selling, and people were still doing business in the city on the Sabbath. And he says he came back and he saw this, and he contended with them, and he went into each one of the, the different rulers in the areas. He says, what are you guys doing? In 19, he says, so it was. At the gates of Jerusalem, as as it began to be dark before the Sabbath, that I commanded the gates to be shut, and I charged that they must not be open till after the Sabbath. And then I posted some of my servants at the gates so that no burdens would be brought in on the Sabbath day. Now the merchants and the seller of all kinds of wares lodged outside of Jerusalem once or twice, And then I warned them, and I said to them, why do you spend the night around the wall? If you do do so again, I will lay my hands on you. For that time on, they came no more on the Sabbath, and I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should go and guard the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. And then he cries out again, oh, Lord, remember me. Oh, Oh, my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of your mercy. He had to go lay hands on these guys. He had to go get rough. The merchants, the ungodly, are hanging out outside the city at the time of Sabbath, and they're going to go ahead and plow on in there the next day, and he goes and closes the gates, and these guys are still sleeping outside, hoping they're going to be able to get in and make a sale on the Sabbath. And he goes out and says, why are you here? I'm not going to let you in. He says, and it got to the point to where I had to go rough them up a little bit to get them to come out here once or twice, and then they quit. I think there's some wisdom in that. I think sometimes you need to rough somebody up a little bit once or twice in order for them to realize that they shouldn't be doing that. But that would be insensitive and unkind and uncaring, and we might offend somebody. (laughs) That'll be misused, too. In those days, I also saw Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. And half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, and they could not speak the language of Judah, but spoke according to the language of one or the other people. And so I contended with them, and I cursed and struck some of them and pulled out their hair. (laughs) And I made them swear by God, saying, You shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons or yourself. Guys, we're living in a time right now to where there is just such insanity that is happening. And when these kids are deceived and they have been indoctrinated to the point that any truth that would have been in them has been obscured by the enemy, and they find themselves standing in front of those who should have understanding, who should be those who have knowledge, and we don't take action, we're at fault. Now, I'm not advocating something crazy. You guys, you need to understand our hearts need to break, but there's this absence of any type of action. There's this tolerance of insanity that's going on by masses and and the whole of people throughout this culture that we look at something and nine out of ten people look at it and go, that's wrong. And then they turn around and they walk the other way. 
And nobody's willing to go up to that one and say, you know what, this may not be the right way to do this. There's no collective voice except for those that are promoting that which is continuing and increasing the insanity. And that's why those that have understanding and those that have knowledge need to realize that the only way that we can stand and the only way that we will win this battle in our Lord at this time is that in and with God we succeed. And without God, we fail. Hmm. He pulled out their hair. <laughs> Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations there was no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all of Israel. Nevertheless, pagan women caused him to sin. We should, should we then hear of you're doing at this great evil, transgressing against our God by marrying pagan women. And one of the sons of Jodiah and the son of Elish, or Elisha, the high priest, was a son-in-law of Sanballat, the Hornite. Therefore, I drove him out. Remember them, O God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Thus, I cleanse them of every pagan, I also assign duties to the priests and the Levites, each to his service, and to bring, and to bringing the wood offering and the first fruits at the anointed times. Remember me, O God, for good. What we have seen through the study of Nehemiah gives us great insight on how it is that we're supposed to respond in this time. The worship team can go ahead and come on back up. It all started when Nehemiah answered God's call to secure the city. Remember all the way back then? Nehemiah gets a call. God says, I want you to go to Jerusalem. He'd never been to Jerusalem. I want you to go back. It broke his heart to realize that the city walls were open and down and the people were being destroyed and decimated. And so he goes back, and not only does he go back, but he goes back with a collective strength because he used all of the influence that he had with the king. He used everything that he could in order to be able to accomplish what God had called him to do. Every opportunity that he had to become strategic in the process of doing what God had called him to do, he did. You with me? He didn't just lay back and say, oh, well, we're just going to have to wait until something changes. No, he said, no, what's the, what's the circumstances in which I'm in? What's the situation? The situation is he knew that there were people that were going to oppose him, so he went to his buddy, the king, and he got some letters of authorization. And he went into the situation with the upper hand, knowing that people were going to complain to the king about him, and he had already covered his bases with the king. He had already taken care. He was very strategic. You see, he was not a religious leader. He was not a political leader. He was a business guy. But he was a businessman who understood and adhered to the things of God. And so he knew how to incorporate all of these different aspects of it. And then he led the people and he established the conduct of the people, not based on his greatness, not based on his charisma. He took him right back to the word of God and said, this is the place and how it is that we are going to succeed because with God, we succeed. we succeed. And without God, we fail. We know that in time, Israel fell again. History repeats itself. <laughs> but understand, we have an opportunity. Do you guys realize that today is not yet history? Well, I don't know how long it has to be in the past before. Is yesterday history, or does it have to be a little longer than that? I mean, it's kind of recent events, current events kind of thing still, right? Last week, the week before, two years ago, five years. When does history start? But here's the thing. Today is not history yet. You with me? So there's no need for us to worry about how it is that we would be in the process of repeating history because what needs to happen is, is we need to recognize that God wants us to live in the present. And presently, right now, we can do everything that we can in order to be able to reach this society, to reach this culture, to strengthen those around us, to lead them to and in the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. I want history, when it's recorded about us, to say that we were those that rebuilt that which was tore down. 
that we were those that made an agreement, a vow, a commitment, signed a declaration of dependence upon God and upon His Word, and that we were those that stood with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other, and we rebuilt that which God had allowed us and called us to do in His strength, focusing upon His Word and singing His praise. That's what I want history to record about us. That's what I want them to look back and go, wow, those guys were nuts. Those guys were insane. Do you realize the opposition that they were up against? Did you realize the things that were coming against them? Do you realize the way the government came down on them and the people came down on them and the culture came down on them and everything? And they just stood there, man. They stood there and continued to build that which represented the kingdom of God with a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. That's what I want us to be known for. I hope that that's what you want to be known for. Because we are not living in the future. We're not living in the past. We are living in the present. It's not history yet. The history of this time and, and of us as a people that, that turn to God has not yet been written. Guys, there are walls to build all over this valley. There is opportunity for us to build walls that will protect the hearts and the minds of those that are seeking shelter, that are looking to be able to come in and walk in the paths and the ways of the Lord. But we have to make sure. The first place that it starts is we have to make sure that the wall is firm and secure around who we are in God and that all that is enveloped within those walls is of God so that the evil is outside and not on the inside. And then we stand. And then we do exactly what it is that God has called us to do, and we lead people to the salvation that is found in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. And Lord, may it be that we would be encouraged. Oh, Lord, it's so easy to look or see what's going on around us and go, oh, it's all messed up. Lord, come quick so we don't have to do anything. And Lord, the reality is, is that you've called us to this time, to this place, just as you called Nehemiah and said, go into a desperate situation and rebuild that which gives me honor and glory. Go in and rebuild within the hearts and the minds of the people that it's with me that they will succeed and without me that they will fail. And Lord, may that be our call today, that we would continue in everything that we see, that our greeting would be with God. How are you doing? With God. <laughs> so that we may succeed. And we ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together.
Bless you and keep you, Lord, make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you, the Lord, lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Be salt and light, go out and share Jesus wherever you go. Love you all, we'll see you on Sunday. God bless.